Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, thank you for joining us for our monthly Strengthening Families Networking webinar. This is Kaylin O'Connor from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. I'm glad so many of you could join us today to talk about um, how in Idaho, folks are implementing a protective factors approach with CASA volunteers. And I noticed in our signups that we were we had some folks who are from CASA programs. That's exciting to hear. And for those of you who are not with CASA programs, I hope this will give you some information you can share with your local CASA partners and see whether they'd be able to do something similar to what's happening in Boise. So um, what we're going to cover today, our usual framework for these uh, webinars. I'll share some updates from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. My colleague Martha Reeder will share some updates from the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds. We'll get through all those updates relatively quickly and get into our presentation on protective factors in CASA. And I'll introduce our speakers as when that time comes, but we are joined by Jane Zink and Maureen Derning. Um, I'm very happy that they can be with us. So I want to share just a couple words about these webinars for those of you who may be new to it. Um, <clears throat> this is an open invitation. Anyone can join us. Um, it's aimed at those who are using the Protective Factors Framework um, and coordinating Strengthening Families efforts, whether that's within an agency or at the state level. Um, we convene these uh, jointly between CSSP and the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds. And we coordinate a different topic each month um, that could be coordinated by CSSP, by the Alliance, or by a volunteer from the Strengthening Families National Network. Um, so I encourage you, if you have a topic that you would like to share information on or just a topic that you think we should cover, please um, let us know that. All the recordings and materials from past webinars are archived at a Google site maintained by the Alliance. Um, it's a long link there, but it always goes out um, in the newsletter. So the newsletter will always include the invitation to the next webinar, as well as a link to the recording of the previous one, which is also where all the others are archived. So if you're relatively new to GoToWebinar, here are a couple tips. The primary thing is to make sure that you let the system know whether you're using your phone or whether you're using your mic and speakers on your computer. Um, bad things happen when it's confused about that. And if you call in with your phone, um, then it'll show you a personalized audio pin, which we ask you to enter into your phone so that the system can connect the incoming phone call with your name. And um, then we can see if you raise your hand or have a question. Uh, we can unmute you so that you can speak. So those are some basic tips. I'm not going to go over all of them. If you're having trouble, type into the chat box or the question box, and um, one of us will try to help you. Um, the other fail-safe is if it's not working, hang up and call back. <laughs> and sometimes that'll just solve the problem. So uh, just so you know, the upcoming webinars on February 11th, we will be talking about Caring Conversations, which is a new CAFE model from zero to three. So in that context, we'll talk a little bit about CAFEs in general and how parents are getting engaged in conversations um, that help them build their protective factors and build parent leadership. Um, as well as talking about this new model specifically. So um, register now if you like. And again, that invitation will go out in the e-update newsletter that goes out at the end of the month. Um, and then on March 10th, we'll focus on strengthening families and healthy marriage and relationship education. I'm very excited that we have a document coming out soon about this. Um, folks who are from the state leadership teams for strengthening families in Missouri and Georgia have worked together um, where both of those uh, strengthening Families leadership teams have folks on their, um, who are faculty at universities and in extension programs who do a lot of work on healthy marriage and relationship education, and they wrote up, you know, sort of how you can do healthy marriage and relationship education with a protective factors lens and how the two things fit together. Um, we're still determining our topic for April. Please, again, let me know if there are specific topics you'd like to see as we go through the year. We'll be needing um, volunteers to lead some of those sessions or to coordinate who's going to speak, and always appreciate um, people volunteering for that. Okay, so now I'm going to formally give some updates from CSSP. Um, one thing that I've been talking about on each of these webinars over the last uh, six months or so is a scripted curriculum. This was developed through work with child welfare jurisdictions that are implementing Strengthening Families. And my former colleague, Nila Farasan, um, pulled together uh, training materials that were being developed for specific jurisdictions. 
um, and for specific needs and pulled them all into one uh, pretty comprehensive curriculum that really gets into the nitty gritty of how you do strengthening families, how you take a protective factors approach in child welfare work. So some of the materials are relevant for other audiences as well or can be adapted, but it really is written to that child welfare audience. Um, six of the eight modules in the curriculum have been released so far, so um, two more to go. Those will be announced in the e-updates as they come out. Um, for each one, there's slides, a script, and activities. And actually, you can see on the side of the webinar, in your webinar panel, um, there's a handout that describes the Strengthening Families scripted curriculum. So if you'd like to look at that and see what the topics are, um, really please let me know if you have questions about how you might adapt it. Um, if you're able to get that into the hands of your Child Welfare Training Academy, that would be ideal because we think it has a lot of good content that they could integrate into the trainings that they're already doing. I also wanted to take a minute to talk about the parents' assessment of protective factors. So this is a survey for parents that was developed out of the Quality Improvement Center for Early Childhood at CSSP. It was released, <clears throat> excuse me, it was released in fall of 2014. And so now that it's been out for over a year, we just wanted to check in about how people are using it, what you're finding, what kind of results you're getting, um, or any questions you have about its use. So um, just informally wanted to throw this out there, that if you have experiences with it and you'd be willing to share, please let us know. Um, my email address is there, along with Charlene Harper Browns. Um, please let us both know. And you can learn more about the Parents Assessment of Protective Factors at the website listed here. As well as there, you can also learn about the Protective Factors Survey, which is the other valid and reliable instrument that's out in the field for um, measuring changes in parents' protective factors. And I have a request. We are looking for um, folks who are working in communities where um, the early childhood work that's going on, whether it's strengthening families work or other efforts to um, improve early childhood development, where there are connections between that work and community violence prevention. So we're thinking of violence occurring outside the home, so community safety issues and, um, you know, sort of often it seems the people who are working on that are more focused on youth and young adults um, and not intersecting that much with the early childhood players. And so we're interested in finding places where those connections are being made and places where people are interested in making those connections. So if you fit into either of those groups, or if you know someone who would fit that description, please let me know. We are currently scheduling some interviews to learn more about what people are doing and um, very excited to share what we'll be doing going forward. But as a starting point, we're doing those interviews and really hoping that you guys can help us find the right people to talk to. So again, my email address is there, um, or if you just wanna type into the chat box that you'd like to talk, I will make a note of that and I'll get in touch with you after the webinar. Thank you. And now we can have updates from uh, Martha Reeder from the Alliance. Thanks, Kaylin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to be with you this afternoon and wish you Happy New Year and share some updates from the Alliance. Um, this is a map of the, the um, certified trainers that the Alliance has trained across the country in our curriculum around the protective factors. Um, bringing the protective factors framework to life in your work. And actually, since this map was put together, we have added another um, almost 30 trainers in Washington State and a few from other states across the country that attended the training in Yakima in December. So um, we, are, um, we have a lot of trainers across the country, and there are some exciting things that are going on related to to these trainings, um, and we just wanted to share that information with you and share with you about some up, uh, upcoming trainings that are going to be occurring across the country. Um, we will have a training in Fresno County, uh, California, the first three days of March, but that uh, training is already full, and there won't be any available slots for that training. We will have a training in Utah the 17th through the 19th of May, and that training is sponsored by the Children's Trust Fund there with Cassie Salim as the um, director of the trust fund there. And um, we will most likely be um, have, have a number of slots in that training, and we'll be putting the registration link up on our website in the next week or so. 
And um, then, uh, then we have another training scheduled in Wisconsin um, sometime, you know, the 21st through the 23rd of June. And we have some other trainings, too, that are in the works, in the making right now, so there may be others to come along. If you want to learn about these and other training opportunities, I've given you the website uh, on, our, on our website, the location on our website, where you can go and um, put your contact information. And we'll put you on a dis distribution list where you will be notified about any training that are coming up. Or if you're interested in hosting a training and you want to contact me personally, and I can share some information with you about what that's like and um, what what the process would look like. So we welcome you to do that and uh, to stay informed and and send uh, those that you think you might want to become certified in this training. Uh, the there's incredible work going on out as these trainers are delivering this training all over the country. It's very exciting. Um, I want to share with you some more information about the Birth Parent National Network, and that's in the next slide. Um, this very week, um, two of the parents that are on the Birth Parent National Network were, were recognized by the Casey Family Program's Excellence for Children Awards in Seattle. And it's quite an honor to, um, to be recognized in this way. And we want to congratulate Corey Best from Florida and Tony Minor from Colorado. And upcoming is the Strengthening Families Training Institute in Boise. And we're going to be hearing from some of our friends from Boise later in the call this, this afternoon. Um, three of uh, our VPN and parents will be sharing uh, on ways that they are um, utilizing protective factors in their own states and jurisdictions and discussing how they're engaged in just promoting those in the designs of systems they are involved with, policies and practices. And um, I, I want to recognize Janae Moss from Utah, Sandra Collette from New York, and again, Corey Betts from Florida who will be participating in that. The um, Children's Bureau is creating a fact sheet for families about family re reunification. It will be distributed during the uh, National Foster Care Month in May, and two of our birth parent uh, national network parents are going to be contributing to that and working with the Children's Bureau uh, as that is being developed. Elise Hagel from Washington State and Timothy Phipps from Oregon. So um, there's a lot of work going on with the Birth Parent National Network. Coming up, uh, the first call of this year for the Birth Parent National Network is going to be on uh, Thursday, February 11th, and that's on the next slide. Just some information about that. Uh, it'll be at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and um, plans are being made to expand um, how parent voices uh, can have an impact at the local, state, and national levels to help educate policymakers and key stakeholders um, in child welfare reform efforts. And um, those uh, plans are going to be really in the, the beginning stages and being discussed on this first networking call of the year in February. If you're interested in joining the BPN, uh, you can go to our website and complete an online membership application. There's an application there both for parents and for organizational partners. Um, and if you have any further questions, please contact um, our senior consultant, Meryl Levine, who is uh, working with the Case Family Programs in, in implementing this effort. And, um, and so we, we're really invite you to, to be a part of this work and to join in. It's, it's been a very exciting year this past year, and the network is growing. And so um, we invite you to join in as we, um, as we move ahead in this new year. I think that's all I have today. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, and with that, uh, those great updates, we are going to jump into our topic for the day. And um, as I mentioned, we're joined by two of our great partners in Boise um, who have presented on this webinar several times before because they're always doing such great work. So we have Maureen Durning um, from Butterfly Trainings That Transform and Jane Zink from the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children. And I'm not going to say too much more, so you guys can just jump in.
Okay, thanks so much, Kaylin. Um, just a little background. Um, Jane and I have worked together doing strengthening families training and technical assault, uh, technical assault, technical <laughs> consulting uh, for 10 years now. And um, I used to work at Idaho AUIC. I retired a couple of years ago to create my own strengthening families uh, training and consulting firm, which is called Butterflies Training, Butterfly Trainings that Transform. Um, one of the things that I've been very happy about is that here in Boise, we have a, um, it's probably a quarterly meeting um, through the Idaho Children's Trust Fund where everyone who is interested in strengthening families work, we all get together and we get to meet each other. So this is where I became, um, I became friends with some of the folks at the Family Advocates Program. And um, yeah, we'd like to go to the next slide. So I became friends with some of the folks at the Family Advocates Program, and as we got talking, um, we realized that they really wanted to transform their agency into what we like to call a strengthening families agency. Um, their goal was that all of the volunteer guardians would demonstrate the integration of the strengthening families protective factors into their investigation and report writing. And there's a few of the um, statistics about how many people were involved with this. Here in Idaho, the guardian ad litems are all volunteers. I know in some states it's, it's handled differently, but, um, but um, so when we talk about volunteer guardians, um, that's everybody, everybody doing this work. The, the overall um, future goal was to incorporate this work into the entire agency, but last year, during the calendar year of 2015, we worked primarily on, um, on the Guardian Ad Litem program. Jane and I, knowing that from the work that we've done, we've kind of come up with my favorite three Ps. Um, I know that when you're doing strengthening families work, if it's going to be effective, it has to be personal, practical, and progressive. Personal because we all have these protective factors. We can't teach what we don't know, and you have to be able to recognize these things in yourself before you can incorporate them into your work. Practical because if people go away from a training or from a, a consulting um, session and they don't have some things on their to-do list right away that are going to incorporate these protective factors into their work, then there's really no sense in doing it. And by progressive, we mean there has to be a progression. You can't just do one training. There has to be a system, a series of, a series of trainings, a series of technical assistance, a series of turning the training that we do over to trainers within the agency so that it can be sus uh, sustained across time. Um, the next slide, please. So from the um, Strengthening Families um, website, we, we saw this, um, this grid about the steps to integration, the steps to becoming a Strengthening Families agency, and the three steps were educate, integrate, and ensure accountability. So we used that in our, in our planning with the folks at Family Advocates. We used that to figure out, okay, what are, what are the things that we're going to do to cover all of these bases um, so that the agency could become fully integrated. Um, so under educating, we, um, we, um, I, I'm not going to go into these things too detailed right now because the rest of the PowerPoint will be talking about all of these individual things. but. Um, you can see there's a progression of trainings there, um, including trainings for all the volunteers and for the board members. Um, strengthening families has to come not just from the bottom up, it has to come from the top down too. Um, integrating in articulating the protective factor as outcomes, um, we created a method of uh, evaluating the reports that the guardian ad litems do. Um, and, um, over on the right side, changing practices or services to integrate the protective factors, that really came down to what the goal of these trainings was. What are the strategies to get the protective factor framework into the heads and hearts and minds of the folks doing the investigating and the reporting? Um, and then assuring accountability 
um, we had we came up with some um, pretty intensive supervising tra supervisor training and some ways of evaluating the reports so that we could show that there was um, a capacity to build the protective factors and we're going to get into more detail about each of those as we go on. So next slide please. Okay, so education really um, began with training in this project. We know that all volunteers for Home Visiting, Parents Anonymous, and CASA are all housed in one agency in this particular organization. And so in, in the Strengthening Families training was employed in some groups but not others. So really this organization really came to understand that they needed to really infuse all volunteers, all people who interact within their program with the uh, protective factor training. And so we gave a just a basic Strengthening Families 101 to all the volunteers and then staff and board had differentiated trainings. We also really then, taking that data and the feedback from that, developed intermediate and advanced trainers for supervisors and coordinators. So supervisors and are people who evaluate the volunteers' reports and they themselves um, they themselves are guardian ad litems and they're supervisors. They don't have as heavy of a load as some of the volunteers, but they do uh, are very familiar with the work. Um, when we're talking about education and just the transformation of an agency or the shift of an agency to strengths-based programming, social and emotional competence is really an important protective factor. And we sometimes don't talk about that one very much in the context of organizations, but the more we do this work, the more we realize that it is really the, one of the very key protective factors. Because we have to have personal communication skills, um, especially around active listening and respectful communication. In this organization, that volunteers who had been with them for, for years and years, we also see this in our work with, for example, probation and parole or juvenile justice, where they have, we have people who are kind of trained in a law enforcement mindset, and then we're asking them to make a shift to kind of a social work or a strength-based mindset. And so patience, perseverance, lots of lots of um, active listening, lots of validating, and lots of respectful communication is really essential to this process. Um, on the right is just kind of some text that we use to talk about um, when an organization commits to this framework, we really have to commit to each other making the shift, right? And that's using the language even when it feels forced and it feels unnatural, asking for help and reinforcing the shift with our colleagues when I waver or with my colleague wavers. And so again, that's just to emphasize the importance of social and emotional competence. Okay, next slide please. So within our trainings, um, within particularly the intermediate and advanced trainings, we created some training activities which would help to test the assumptions. Um, um, in the blue box down there, our minds are programmed to fill in the blanks. When we don't have very much information about something, we, we just tend to fill it in. So a couple of the training activities that we um, created that were very um, very successful, I think, are um, a Four Corners activities where uh, people are given very little information about biological families, about caregivers and children, and then have to decide um, um, which of these families would I be willing to trade places with on the very little little information that is that is given, and then. Um, and then we give them more information, and so so it it becomes a um, it becomes a very personal reflection on on what do I know, what do I not know, um, and how if if this if this family was a client of mine, how would I how would I be able to um, accept and celebrate their strengths even in the midst of all of the challenges that I see. Um, it demands that we fight any instinct to assume the worst and instead consciously look for the best in others. Uh, we have another activity that we call Truth Time where we take statements like the ones shown there, reunification is in the best interest of the child, um, and talk about is this true, why would this be true, why would this not be true, um, and um, because we know that we know that that is a true statement, that in all but the very, very most extreme cases, 
reunification is in the best interest of the child. And so um, that, can be a, that can be a difficult thing to wrap your head around. And so we know that in doing these trainings, we have to get to these deep-seated assumptions um, that the volunteers um, may or may not have before the training is really going to be effective. We also make sure that um, we're not we're not glossing over the fact that the, the families do have very significant challenges. And Jane's going to talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Okay, so one of the um, one of the places where we spend a lot of time in our training is really uh, talking about relentless compassion, which is actually a term borrowed from Darkness to Light, Stewards of Children. And we we um, pair this with visioning exercises and we talk about compassion and the fact that relentless compassion is grounded in respect for others and a demand for accountability. A lot of time when we're talking about strengths-based approach, especially for people who are not familiar with it, who came to CASA, who came to be a guardian ad litem because of the experiences that they've had in their own lives which were not positive and they want to help somebody or help a child escape from a terrible situation or they want to support a child that um, they feel is in a you know, they want to advocate for children. Um, sometimes people see strength-based work as an you know, excusing or ignoring the, the bad behavior of biological families. And so we really want to delineate between compassion and strength-based and how all these things play <laughs> together. And um, to, to ensure that, or to reiterate that every adult is accountable and deserves the, and deserves the support necessary for personal change taking into consideration any fears or concerns. And so accountability and having these discussions about accountability and also about respect, really important to the process of thinking about how we can use the protective factors when we're investigating um, and reporting on behalf of children. We also talked a lot about how easy or hard it is to think about relentless compassion when it comes to children and then when it comes to families of origin. And so these are just all really rich discussions to get at why people have volunteered and how how they volunteer can align with the Strengthening Families Framework and what shifts that they might have to make to be successful with that. Okay, good description, Jane. <laughs> um. Okay, minimum sufficient level of care is probably a term that's familiar to those of you who are involved with, um, with any um, CASA programs, um, grappling with the idea that what they say is all children need is good enough parenting, and we can really define that as a good enough amount of the protective factors. Uh, we have a picture of um, buckets of balls there. The training activity we did um, that really was a good visual. We had, we had, um, <laughs> I still have in my closet a box with a thousand ping pong balls in it. So we've, we've got ping pong balls that we, we figure represent the amounts of protective factors that families have. And we, um, we had different buckets with, um, labeled with the different protective factors and had the uh, participants at the training go through and actually think of the think of the strengths that they could see in different model families and put them in as representing ping pong uh, I mean the ping pong balls represent the the um, the strengths and we could then you know, actually have a visual of how many ping pong balls need to be in there to, to show a good enough amount of protective factors. What is the minimum sufficient level of care? And of course, in our work, if we are able to help families build those protective factors and have those buckets just overflowing with ping pong balls, think of how much better that is for the children. Um, so, so that was one of the one of the activities we did at um, at the intermediate advanced trainings. Um, pulling out one sentence here about um, in the best interest means that the volunteer knows the child well enough to identify the child's needs. One of the things that we hear from the judges is that when they read these reports, they want to be able to know these children and know these families from what's written on that report. And so um, having the volunteers have some information about, for instance, um, child development, 
so that they know is this you know what is this two year old doing what is this five year old doing and and how can I how can I describe that to the judge one of the judges said you know we want to know what that kid dresses up for on Halloween we want to know what his favorite toy is or what her favorite food is so um, we look at we look at this physical representation of putting those ping pong balls in the in the um, in the buckets as a, a way to remind the to remind the guardian of items uh, what it is they're looking for. And anything I think, to volunteer? Anything that you have changed? Yeah, that I think that this was uh, this is the this is something we could have grappled with all day long because everybody has a different idea of what sufficient level of care means. I mean, there's guidance and there's opinion around that guidance and there's gut feeling around the guidance and so it's all it's very challenging for volunteers and it's really great to have a discussion with everybody about what the what the what, what the guidance is that's written down from the agency what is the law what is what do the judges think and what do the people with all kinds of various experiences in the system think and so again really very rich conversation that i think all um, helps to build the foundation from which then we can begin to talk about the protective factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. So one of the um, one of the <coughs> critical pieces of a volunteer's job is to write a report that communicates to the judge, right? And that investigation really it's a physical and emotional investment of time and talent, and it's really it grounded in a person's personal commitment. Again, in Idaho, the vast majority of the guardian ad litems are personally committed to this, and they're volunteering their time. And they speak for a child who cannot advocate with their own voice, and they experience her family in a way that others can't. It's a very unique and valuable perspective. And so this question of how do you effectively communicate what you've learned to the judge came up time and time again in our trainings. And it, um, we, from, from that feedback, we developed a more advanced training that really focuses on language and the writing of the reports. So we'll talk about that in the next slide, please. So really, we needed to have a writing workshop that was consistent across the, um, the judicial districts to increase consistency of the way the reports were written, to focus on information that only the guardian ad litems can provide, for example, avoiding the rap sheet of the biological parents, because that some of that information the judge has access to through other records. So it's, again, zeroing in on that unique information that the guardian ad litems bring to the table. We really took a lot of time analyzing sentences out of reports for judgment, tone, and bias. Again, we have a lot of, um, sometimes assumptions are made unconditionally, bias creeps into our writing, and that in and of itself um, can affect the communication that we are giving to the court. We focused a lot on um, specific, observable, concise writing and opinion versus fact. And so, you know, we just, we, we took apart a lot of reports with the volunteers, a lot of pieces and parts of reports for examples, for analysis, for again, for discussion. We did a writing workshop around taking sections of reports and rewriting them. And um, this all contributes then to what we ultimately did, which was to help um, writers write using the framework of the protective factors and then having an evaluation tool that evaluates how the protective factors are showing up in the reports. So, for example, we um, on the right-hand side, it says, Ms. showed up to parenting class and hasn't been there since. What kind of, what is, how does that communicate a sentiment compared to Ms. X attended one parenting class? So we talk about sometimes in our writing, if we are not careful and if supervisors are not providing adequate support, that bias slips in. We talked about uh, mother makes no effort to contact children. I mean, really, we talk about what information would a guardian actually need to be able to make that statement. Well, you would really have to have a lot more information than um, than not because it's it's a loaded statement. And then aunt and uncle have been caring for all of toddler's needs very well. Again, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? What did you see? What's what's observable about these um, about the words on the page? And so really we wanted to focus on empowering the guardians to just explain, you know, help them realize how very, very powerful this tool is and how we want to capitalize on all of the work that they've done, capitalize on their commitment and present the best possible um, report to the judge. Yeah. So next slide, please. Um, so we 
we talked with the with the um, the volunteers and the staff about having a values match that if we're going to integrate this protective factor framework way of looking at things, it's going to mean changing the way we think about and conduct our investigating and reporting. Um, strengthening families is now the stated value of the organization, and this may challenge long-held personal beliefs to fill our commitment to doing what's best for the child. We might really have to make a shift. Um, it's really important to look at how we're feeling about this shift. Um, Jane says it's a conversion story like going vegan or adopting meditation or getting a baby. Now we look at things differently. There's a, um, a wonderful grid that we use in other trainings where um, you can match yourself against the skills that you need for a job and the values match that you have for a job. And it's very important and it's why this Strengthening Families 101 training that all volunteers take when they come into the Family Advocates Agency um, that they realize right away this is a Strengthening Families strength-based agency and so if my values don't match that then I should go somewhere else. So, um, so um, and I don't mean to sound harsh about that, it's, it's much more just um, you know, when you when you when you go into any any new situation, you very quickly get a sense of what the culture is of that organization. And so, um, if this is a protective factor, strength-based organization, then um, the the values of of all the guardian ad litems and now really of of everyone who works there. Um, has to fit with that, or else, or else the culture is—it's is, it, it, not going to work. It, there'll be discord. There'll be a discordant feeling in the in the agency. So that's why we um, talk a bit about about what the values are of the agency and um, and um, what your personal values are, and do they do they work together as you as you take on this volunteer position? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so really, again, lots of reflection with the volunteers, lots of reflection with the staff. It's like, it's really time to say, you know, do I really want to look at parents, children, caregivers, and families through a strength-based lens? Like Maureen um, said, sometimes the answer is no, I really don't. And so then we, then we can meet that person where they are and decide what to do next, right? Do we want to learn about strengthening families? Do we want to consciously practice? You know, can we, are we willing to connect with coworkers and supervisors? Are we willing to use those protective factors in report writing? And then the last one I think is a really big um, consideration for volunteers. Can I commit to the time it takes to uncover parental strengths during an investigation? I mean, it takes more time to use the protective factor framework when you're investigating, and sometimes caseloads are so heavy and people don't have, have the time or the opportunity. And, and again, and there's no right or wrong answers to these questions. They are just starting points for discussions. Again, social and emotional competence are very important throughout this whole process because people need to be able to say, like, I don't think I can do that, and then we can we decide what to do next. Mm -hmm. But what supports do I need? Um, in the course of these trainings, volunteers really identified a lot of supports that they needed that they did not have access to before. For example, I need some developmental guidelines. I need to understand what a two-year-old is supposed to be doing or a five-year-old or what's typical of a, a you know, a 14-year-old or what's typical of a child who's experienced trauma so that I can, I can have a guide, guidepost to say specifically what I see and to make an intelligent um, observation about that instead of using terms like well or great or happy. And then also I need a second set of eyes on this report. Again, it's a time commitment on behalf of the staff, to, especially with the volunteer pool, to really um, commit to, to engaging in reflective feedback because we need to help. We need, we, you know, we no one does anything without uh, guidance and supervision. And so, any time that a volunteer needs help or a report needs to be rewritten, we need to be able to have the capacity to have conversations and to ask the questions and to really engage with them in how to make the report better. And just one more thing, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these questions and can I commit to the time it takes to cover parental strengths? Um, why would I want to do that? Because we know that it works. So if if we get those those ping pong balls 
very, you know, overflowing in those buckets. If we can do whatever we can do to help uh, the parents and the children and the and the um, foster families, if we can help all of them to build their protective factors, it's only going to be the best outcome for everybody. Um, so, you know, I, as Jane was talking, I was thinking, why do we want to do this? That's why. You know? <laughs> and one of the things that occurs to me often in doing strengthening families work is how how everything there is in your life can be covered by those five protective factors. There's nothing that falls outside of them. So, you know, anything I need, any any kind of supports I need, any kind of information I need, um, any kind of emotional support I need, it all fits under those five protective factors. So it really can give the guardian ad litems a, a good um, a good language to be able to recognize things in their investigating and to be able to write it down in their reporting in a way that it, it's consistent and makes sense with everybody. So that's why. <laughs> so next slide, please. So in in coming, um, so kind of going we, we knew that the, the guardian on items out there doing their investigating and then they're writing their reports. And when we originally looked at the reports, there was a wild variety of, you know, from, from things that were written very, very minimally to very flowery to um, there was no consistency at all. One thing that we did know, though, is that many of the times um, in the reports, things were noticed. Things like the parents report they are maintaining sobriety. So we started to think, okay, if the parents report they're maintaining sobriety, what kind of explanation would you need in order to know that? And they might say that they were sober for five weeks, they were attending AA meetings together, and they went four times a week. And so um, then we started to think, well, what protective factors does that does that relate to? And those 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 explanations relate to resilience, concrete support, and social connection. So we came up with this framework of notice, name, explain. And we actually were able to um, create a, a rubric of how we could review the reports and look at what was being noticed and then actually um, um, chart and grade, um, okay, if it's noticed, is it also named in, in the protective factor language and is it explained what it's mean, what, what the meaning is. Um, the reason we wanted to do this was um, to maximize the guardian, uh, the guardian on items value added for the judge. So we trained the supervisors to provide reflective feedback on the reports so that it's, you know, like a feedback loop. They could sit down with, um, with the report writer and um, go over what they wrote and, and be able to say, well, I see that you noticed this, but did you name it? Did you explain what you meant by it? Um, the writer should be able to articulate why any detail is included in the report and um, to intentionally use the protective factors in recommendations and avoid recommendation by default. I think we talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we talk about that a little bit in the next in the next slide. Next slide, please. So the um, recommendations are some are can be very um, generic, really. Mother take a parenting class are, is a very common recommendation. And so we really challenge the guardian ad litems to think about making those recommendations in the language of the protective factors. So instead of saying mother take a parenting class, we say mother increase the knowledge of parenting and child development. And maybe here are six, you know, and here are six ways that that could happen. You could take a parenting class, you could have a mentor, you could go to Parents Anonymous, you could be in a support group, you could use the um, baby steps. There are just a, a lot of ways and a lot of resources within the community to increase your knowledge of parenting and child development because often um, the families who are who are in the system have taken a lot of parenting classes. And so maybe that isn't the answer for that particular parent. Maybe there are other ways to increase um, knowledge of parenting and child development. So this is really, in the end, where we'd like to see the recommendations going for the reports. And this is also a way of helping um, familiarize the judges who are in the system with the protective factor framework and all of the ways that we might accomplish the same goal, but still be flexible enough to um, to accommodate a, a family mm -hmm. and to honor a family, really. 
Yeah, and it also kind of challenges the report writer to not think in terms of a checklist because, you know, things like taking a parenting class we saw lots of times, you know, and so um, we want to get away from that, that checklist mentality and, and think a little, a little more deeper, a little more deeply. Um, next slide, please. So part of the training that we did, um, and this, this um, managing complex change chart may be familiar to, um, to many of you. I, I love this chart. <laughs> um, it, it, in order to have a successful complex change, you need to have vision plus skills plus incentives plus resources plus an action plan. And then, hooray, you've got some um, powerful change. We were lucky in this work with the Family Advocates Program that we started out with the vision, which was the goal of the training. Um, and we were able to, um, with our trainings and technical assistance and consulting with the agency, we were able to um, offer them um, many of the skills. It was really up to them to do the rest of those, the rest of those things, and we're actually working now um, everything we're talking about now is what we did last year, and right now we're working on an action plan on how to how to continue this work um, in 2016. Um, so this is a really nice thing for anybody who's um, who's confronting any kind of um, complex change, either in an organization or even just personally. You know, to uh, you're you're gonna you're gonna feel confused, anxious, resistant, frustrated, and um, and having false starts if you if you don't get all of these pieces and parts in place. <laughs> right, and the nice thing about this change chart is you can use it for a whole organization or you can use the same chart for a small initiative like just getting the protective factors and the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so really when we're talking about, about we need to think about how we could quantify change um, and demonstrate change in the report writing. So we developed a rubric to assess reports that were written by the guardians. Um, a group of staff who didn't write the reports were trained in using the tool and then the reports were scored by a team to check for scoring consistency. And so we want to share with you the, the data about the incorporation of protective factors into the reports. And this analysis focused on mid-case or final reports. Okay, next. Slides. So overall, the average score, so for each of the five protective factors, the report was assessed as to whether the writer noticed, um, named, or explained the protective factor. And that data was used by supervisors to support, support the guardian ad items in their investigation and the reporting and this um, move towards using the protective factors in both. And what we saw, it was, it was a, there's an N of 28 for the uh, reports that were before the training and post was 30, and we saw an increase in the use of the protective factors in describing the strengths and needs of children, foster family, and birth family, um, but no positive change in the recommendations as a result of more information being provided to the court to describe the condition of the child or family. And so we, we made headway on the notice naming, explaining in the body of the report, but um, not any headway on the, on the recommendations, and again, that's going to be a focus for continuing education. Okay, um, from a child's perspective, when we're looking at looking at those five protective factors in reference to the child, naming using the language of the protective factors went nearly unchanged, um, and we anticipate or we we guessed that this might be related to comfort, anticipation that the reader might be unfamiliar with the labels, or a perception that it would not add clarity to the report. So again, that is a that's a place where we have an opportunity for more continuing education, evaluation, and discussion. But um, also, the, it presents opportunities to enhance the understanding of guardian ad litems about what resilience looks like and what social connections might be considered for children. These two protective factors aren't as readily observed, and so training might need to approach them a bit differently because we saw a lot of uh, a big increase in um, social and emotional competence and concrete support and in a noticing of child development, or yeah, noticing and explaining of child development, but not so much about social connections and resilience. Okay, the next slide shows um, a parent. So we saw a slight increase in noticing concrete supports like housing, medical, transportation, and a slight decrease in explaining those protective factors. And then we saw an increase both in noticing and explaining social and emotional competence, social connection, and resilience. 
And so we we guess that the, that the degree to which the ad, guardian ad litems increase their reporting of social connections for parents is very significant. And it might reflect training content, which emphasizes protective factor in ex examples and experience. And some of these things are just easier to spot in, in the course of your day-to-day -day, um, interaction with families. And so this is just very preliminary, the very first go-round of looking at this, these reports. And so we're excited to continue to use the rubric and to um, examine our results and to tweak our training and to see what happens next. Okay, so really this just shows um, what we've been talking about in terms of organization, that when we have a service delivery and it comes through the lens of strengthening families, either an organizational lens or a small focus lens, we can really um, promote the protective factors and strive to have optimal outcomes for clients. And then on the next slide, we um, wanted to show that in keeping with the personal, progressive, and practical tenants, what we realized in family advocates and what they realized is that really it's, the, it's what's happening within the organization that needs to be a little bit more systematic and a little bit more practical. And so they're really thinking about focusing their volunteer training, um, changing it in a way that incorporates more strengthening family specific um, focus, and then how to how to structure follow-up support to people who receive the training, how to train all volunteers, because of course when you have a volunteer workforce, people are available at different times and they have different levels of commitment. And so really thinking about how we can best follow up and provide technical assistance to supervisors in their um, sessions, in their supervisory sessions, and then how we can participate in ongoing evaluation of reports, volunteers, and staff. And so those are kind of on the docket for the next steps for, um, for this organization. And then finally, um, yeah, I just wanted to show, you know, we always talk about the protective factors. They, they move through your organization and within your organization are, the, are really primary areas of focus for any organization that's trying to accomplish this. But really the, on the next, the very last slide, we really wanted to show, um, look, can you switch, there you go. Is, is really, oh, last one. Last one. Yeah. Sure it is. That, you know, we're thinking about connecting the dots and the work that we're doing through CSSP. It's like if every organization is that prism and their service comes in and it goes out as the protective factors, then that's how we can connect the dots between all of our agencies and really try to get this work not only within the organization, not only to the um, providers or to the clients, but then to other agencies. And so it starts with the everyday actions. It, and it goes right up the scale of abstraction to practice and policy and all of the people who work within our agencies and across our states. And that is really, um, that's really the aim of every agency that undertakes this work, to build the protective factors not only within and not only in the clients, but across, across because that's how we're going to make the most, um, make the most impact. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to, um, I think a few of the folks from or the Family Advocates Program are on the call right now, and I would just, in, in um, for, for Jane and myself, just really thank them for having us come in and do this work. Last year was just, a, it was a wonderful creative, um, it was just a, a very fulfilling creative process to, to be able to sit down and figure out, you know, how can we really make an agency um, shift their focus and, and become a strengthening families agency. We've been working in the field of child care for many years and are on the way to doing it there, but um, it was exciting to do it to do it for a, a completely different um, different group of people. So if any of you family advocates folks are on the call right now, thank you. <laughs> and I think you're finished, right, Jane? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much. Um, I really just love the perspective that you bring to how you do this training with everyone that you train, but especially with this audience, which I think um, is an audience that a lot of us should be trying to reach out to in our states or communities. So um, I would encourage anyone who'd like to type in a question to do so, or you can raise your hand in the webinar. We've got um, about five minutes left, so we can take a couple questions. And um, if anybody is typing away, uh, which I, don't, I don't ha haven't seen anything typed in yet, uh, so go ahead and type it or raise your hand. In the meantime, 
Um, I wanted to ask, um, on the, the slides about your rubric um, about the tool, it was interesting to me that resilience went down and how often people were naming and noticing it. And I was wondering if part of that is because people may have been using the word resilience um, and then they went through the training and got a more specific, concrete understanding of what resilience means in this context and then might be less likely to note it than just a general sort of this child seems resilient um, as opposed to knowing whether it fits a, a specific definition. Have you, did that come up in your discussion of it? Um, I can't say that it did. I, I, I really don't know why. You know, and we were, and we were not able to, um, um, we were not able yet to go back and, and you know, have specific discussions with any of the people who, who wrote. This is why, uh, again, why the trainings need to be a uh, progression. You know, we need to keep going back and, um, and getting more and more specific about what does what does each one of these protective factors, resilience included, what do they, what do they look like in practice? And um, one thing that, that we did, that um, I believe we, we did start to see is that, as with all people, sometimes I might be much more, much better at noticing social connections than something else. And so when the supervisors can sit down with the individual report writers, they can start to um, work through that and say, you know, boy, you're really good at noticing this and this and this, and let's work more on trying to get the full picture. And the full picture is to notice something, whether it's whether it's a, a whether it's the the presence or the absence of each of the protective factors. Um, so the answer to your question, we really don't know why that happened. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting. Um, I don't see any other questions written in, so um, I'll mention one other thing that um, I recall from the first time I heard about this work going on with family advocates um, was Richard Johnson from Family Advocates talking about it and saying, you know, this is the difference for a birth parent between walking into family court and having a list read off of all your risks versus walking in and starting with the mother's, you know, improving in this way, or the mother has improved, increased her knowledge of parenting and child development by doing this and this, and we still have these concerns. Um, and just the different feeling that that gives the parent um, and the different impression that it gives the judge as a starting point um, for what kind of progress the parent is making. I think that's really powerful and just wanted to mention that. Um, I do see um, a question that has come in from Vicki in Washington. Um, did the concept for using the protective factors framework come from the organization or from outside the organization? In other words, who wanted to make this change? Um, the folks at Family Advocates approached me and said they wanted to make the change. They already had that, um, that vision of um, which, which we talked about as the goal of the trainings. We just their vision that the volunteer guardians would demonstrate the integration of the protective factors into the investigation and report writing. That's what they came to me and said they wanted to do. And I said, well, okay, that's the goal of our training, uh, of our training plan then. And so we started each one of our trainings with revisiting that and saying that's what we're here for. Um, so yeah, it came, it came from them. That's great, great collaboration. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, and we are just about at our ending time. So I'm going to put up our contact information. Um, you can feel free to contact me or Martha from the Alliance. Um, Maureen and Jane are, have their email addresses up here and are, are willing to get questions by email um, that, and, and to discuss this work. We'd love to hear if you are if you are from a CASA organization and you want to start doing this, or if you are um, not from CASA but you're going to reach out to some CASA partners and um, you know just love to hear about progress in this area. I think it's a promising way to move forward and get the protective factors thinking out to more of the service providers and families that really use, can use it. So thank you once again for presenting, uh, Maureen and Jane. So grateful for all your work on this and your willingness to share. And I hope we'll all talk again in February. Thanks, everyone.